Warning, the following contains scenes of intense animated violence and gore. Viewer discretion is advised. The Vajra will soon be manifest within a life force of an as yet unknown power, born to the continual creation and destruction of the universe. Today, the birth of that child has come. I give you Genocyber. Oh, baby, we are crossing a big one off the list today. Released in 1994 by Bandai Visual and subsequently spread internationally through peddlers of gortastic Japanimation schlock manga entertainment, Genocyber has earned its spot in anime history for its notoriety alone. This isn't just any ultraviolet anime we are dealing with here. Oh no, Genocyber belongs in a far more exceptional canon of anime. A canon I like to call the Violence Canon. Hashtag RIP Harold Bloom. The Violence Canon is the body of work that have achieved infamy amongst Western anime fandom past and present. Works that defined the perception of anime for most people in the 90s. Mid to low tier animation, needlessly dark tone, misogynistic undertones, or sometimes overtones, and above all else, hard emphasis on pure, uncut hyperviolence. The beloved canon usually consists of these five works Genocyber, Mad Bull 34, MD Geist, Violence Jack, and Angel Cop. There's probably more I'm forgetting about, but these are the five that stick out the most. Some could argue that a lot of other anime fits the canon, such as Yoshiaki Kawajiri's oeuvre, but I've always felt that even at his most schlocky, his anime kinda has an air of class about it. The canon is reserved for filth only. Filth that got released overseas, mind you, so sorry, wounded man. Oh. We've already gone over one of the canon's titles with Mad Bull 34, and now we venture in deeper with Genocyber. And the best part is, Mad Bull 34, that was the easy part of the canon. That is the canon at its most accessible. With Genocyber, we start the hard stuff. The hard stuff? But enough hype. What exactly is the dealio with Genocyber? Genocyber is truly a fascinating creature. What separates it from other anime selling itself on hyperviolence alone is how it embraces said hyperviolence. The amount of new, innovating ways it invents to a display as grotesque, almost Grand Guignol-esque vision of the world, all wrapped up in a bleak, nihilistic tone in a way that only an angry 15-year-old could love. What am I supposed to do now that I know my life isn't my own? Isn't it just precious? But like every other entry in the violence canon, it does have its apologist. Like, yeah, MD Geist is a bad anime night staple, and Mad Bull 34 can be a guilty pleasure if you're in the right mood, but Genocyber attracts a different breed of cat. I wouldn't call them defenders per se, but there have been some people that say Genocyber deserves at least a second look at. They're not saying it's good or anything, they're just saying that if you give it a fair shake, you'll find that it is maybe not as bad as everyone says it is. And to that I say... Mm, yeah, no, it's still pretty bad. But not for the reasons people think it is. Genocyber certainly does feel like fodder meant for angry reviewers simply because of its excessive violence and overly bleak tone, but those are just surface level criticisms. Genocyber's problems go deep. Because you see, the violence isn't what makes Genocyber a bad anime. It's the fact that it's a potentially good story told terribly that makes Genocyber a bad anime. And before anyone asks, I do know that a lot of people are going to take me to task for even bothering trying to apply a critical lens to an anime like Genocyber. People don't watch Genocyber for the story, they want to see animated gore! I might as well just try to put a critical lens on a Michael Bay movie. But that hasn't stopped other people from doing exactly that, and it's not gonna stop me from talking about Genocyber. So if you've got a problem with me analyzing this trash, why not leave a comment below and calmly explain why that is? I'm sure I'll get around to reading it. Someday. 
Like with many science fiction anime of the late 80s to early 90s, Genocyber's bloody roots stretches all the way back to that 80s cyberpunk cultural touchstone, Bubblegum Crisis. While primarily known for how it shaped science fiction anime, particularly cyberpunk, Bubblegum Crisis is also known for being cut short thanks to production company Malarkey. You see, Bubblegum Crisis was an ambitious joint production between two companies, Artmic and Yomex. But once those two companies got into a huge dispute over money and which studio actually owned the rights of the franchise, the partnership fell apart and Bubblegum Crisis was cut short after 8 of its scheduled 13 episode run. Yomex wasn't too affected by the split as they were also a record label and had anime soundtracks they could always fall back on. Artmic was not so lucky. Being a scrappy little animation studio by comparison, they wanted another smash hit fast. Armic attempted to finish the Bubblegum Crisis story with Bubblegum Crash, but a lawsuit by Yomax cut that out after three episodes, sending Armic back to the drawing board. Around that same time in 1992 though, Armic staff member Tony Takizaki was attempting to break into the manga business. He had already co-written 80 Police Files, a Bubblegum Crisis spinoff that was also cut short by the Yomax split, alongside a mystery screenwriter that we'll talk about later. One of his first manga titles was Genocyber a story about two psychic sisters who are kidnapped by an evil corporation and have to fight their captors by way of mysterious power armor. The manga, from its cyberpunk setting to the designs of power armor, is obviously a stab at making another bubblegum crisis, albeit one with a much darker and grittier tone. Sadly, we don't really know what the full extent of the story was going to be, as it was cancelled after one volume while the main plot was still ramping up. It did, however, give Artmic a much needed springboard for their next big project. All they needed was someone to take the idea and run with it. A lot of the big creative movers and shakers of Bubblegum were either gone or busy with their own projects at that point, so they needed someone new. Looking back at the staff who had worked with them over the years, Armick found someone who had helped them out as a storyboarder for 1987's Dangayo. He was fresh off from working with Gynax on a giant robot project, as well as directing his own original OVA, and he also wasn't really doing anything at the time, so why not have him direct the new project as well as have him storyboard and co-write the anime? And if you've already caught on who this is, then let's welcome back our boy... Ah, uh, Koichi Ohara. We knew we'd have you back sooner or later. But even with a lot of creative power and a love for all things gory and metal, Ohada couldn't do it alone. He needed a co-pilot for this brave new world. That new co-pilot would in fact be our mystery screenwriter, Sho Aikawa. Sho Aikawa's name doesn't carry as much weight as it does nowadays, unless you're in tokusatsu circles, but for a while, he was a standout screenwriter in an industry where writers are mostly there to put the director's ideas into coherent narratives. But while he's mostly known for his work on 12 Kingdoms, Martian Successor Nadesco, and Full Metal Alchemist 2003, his major works prior to Genocyber consisted of the anime adaptation of Legend of the Overfiend and conceiving the original story for Angel Cop. So at the time, he was the right man for the job. But that's just how Genocyber came to be. What about how Genocyber became so infamous? Genocyber came out at a time where the anime boom was just really starting to unfold. Even though it had yet to fully explode, Japanese production companies were starting to take notice at the brand new market that was slowly growing before their eyes. Artmic, probably seeing how well Bubblegum Crisis did in the States, decided that maybe releasing Genocyber in the West before Japan could better its chances for being a big hit. There's also the fact that Genocyber had Jan Scott Fraser on staff, one of the first American animators to work in the anime industry, so she might have also influenced that decision. So producers at Bandai Visual and Localizers Manga Entertainment ended up making Genocyber the first anime to be released in America and the UK before it got released in Japan. The first three episodes, anyway. For some reason, episodes four and five did not see a Western release until five years later in 1999. By that time, Artmic had gone bankrupt, and the Genocyber license had shifted to Central Park Media, which is why the dub after episode three sounds so radically different in voice direction. Manga Entertainment's dub is full of hammy overacting and certain liberties taken with the script. I must have been fucking crazy to let you in on this. Now get lost, <laughs> Fucking asswipe! Central Park Media's dub, on the other hand, doesn't try to drop as much F-bombs into the script. In fact, they don't try much at all. I can't help but hate the air in this damn city. Just let me earn a little more money and then we'll go. 
I have a feeling the next journey is going to be a long one. But, unintentionally humorous voice acting aside, Genocyber is fascinating because of how it almost deliberately pandered to the idea Americans had of anime. And while I'm sure having people like Ohada and Aikawa in the driver's seat certainly influenced the tone and direction of this anime, you almost get the feeling that Artmic, Bandai, and Manga Entertainment were quite thrilled with how the final product came out. Because to them, they were giving American fans what they wanted. So now that we know how we got here, what about the anime itself? Well, I think in order to really examine Genocyber, we need to do a quick detailed rundown of what exactly is the plot of Genocyber. Because you really can't tell someone why a story is badly told if they don't really know the story that is being told. Oh, this is gonna be fun. Part 1. In the early part of the 21st century, all the world's nations have begun the process of forming a new world government to create a new world order. This isn't really that important, but the anime likes to think it is. In the city of Hong Kong, a corporation by the name of the Kuryu Group, called the Kuran Group in the dub for some reason, Kuran. 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 are testing new interesting weaponry to be used in this brave new world of political instability, mainly with the use of cyborgs and psychic powers. The Kuryu Group's two main test subjects are two sisters, Diana, a girl with great intelligence who was born with a crippled body that has since been replaced with augmentations, and Elaine, a girl gifted with powerful psychic energies but who has the mind of an animal. The experiments are overseen by their own father and big-brained individual, Dr. Kenneth Reed. Diana lives as her father's lab rat and is kept in that position through routine abuse. Elaine, meanwhile, has escaped from the lab and ends up befriending a frequently bullied street urchin. While that's going on, a Hong Kong detective is attempting to blow the lid off the Courier Group's secrets and get to the bottom of what exactly they are covering up. This detective is given the hardcore, tough-as-nails detective name known as Davey. Across town, three cyborgs associated with the Kuryu group are tasked with tracking down Elaine and bringing her back to Tokyo in any condition but dead. At the very least, she has to be able to breathe, even if she does get a bit fucked up. But before they can get on the trail, Diana is tracked down her sister and is dispatched to find her wearing a not Nightsaber's power suit. Elaine soon finds herself cornered by her friend's bullies. The lead gang member attempts to rape Elaine, while his goons beat up and molest the little boy. Elaine screams, summons Diana who kills the gang members, but Elaine escapes with the boy in tow, not knowing that the three cyborgs are watching and monitoring their actions. The cyborgs find them in a subway and, after killing all witnesses, decide to take both of them back to base. Unfortunately, Elaine regains consciousness and uses her psychic powers to cause one of the cyborgs to kill himself by tearing out his own brain. Explosions happen, Elaine winds up in a hospital, and the other two cyborgs escape with the boy. Meanwhile, at the hospital, Detective Davy looks over Elaine and begins an info dump about how Reed isn't actually the girl's father, how their real father was killed in a convenient lab accident, and how Reed used both the girls and their mother to obtain more research funding. But before the detective could leave, he comes across Reed and his army of putties going full sleepaway camp on everyone in the hospital, and the last we see of Davy, he's like this. Yep, that's me. I bet you're wondering how I got in this situation. Diana confronts Elaine telepathically, and Elaine tells her what they both already know, that the Kuryu Institute will kill them eventually once they stop being useful. This brings Diana's hidden resentment towards Elaine and her freedom to the surface, causing her to disobey orders and try to kill Elaine. The two sisters fight on the rooftop, but are interrupted by the two cyborgs, who demand Elaine turn herself into them, leaves her little street urchin pal, ends up on the wrong end of a chainsaw blade. But before Elaine can lay the psychic smack down, Diana kills her, and so the cyborgs kill the little boy in response. The cyborgs reveal themselves as hired guns for the Kuryu group and are here to shut down Reed's experiments and take them back to Tokyo. Since Elaine mysteriously didn't leave a corpse when she died, they decide that Diana and Reed are the next best thing. In transit, Diana begins to wake up to the fact that her entire existence is based on a lie, which allows Elaine to forcibly merge souls with her, thus giving form to the titular Genocyber. <laughs> What the f 
fuck? The ensuing explosion kills Reed and forces the cyborgs to reveal their true monstrous forms and fight Genocyber. However, they get bodied with one being ripped in half and the other being slammed into a passenger plane. In the silent aftermath, the now resurrected Elaine comes across the soul of the deceased street urchin. He tells her how thankful he was to have a friend like her before fading away. Elaine, in a fit of soul-rending grief, goes into a psychic rage, triggers second impact, and obliterates Hong Kong off the map. End of Part 1 Part 2 Sometime after the first part, war has broken out in a fictional country. To drive this plot point home, this anime opens up with a lovely image of children getting mulched by a helicopter's machine gun. <laughs> However, Elaine is there. Now sporting a cyborg body that she didn't have before even after merging with Diana, she turns into Genocyber and destroys the copter. The Kuryu group, now working with the United States government under orders from Anime Montana Max, deploys an aircraft carrier to the area to investigate. Knowing that Genocyber might be in the area, they secretly bring aboard their new secret weapon, the Vajra, an otherworldly psychic being that can fuse with any weapon to enhance its capabilities. Elaine, who has been mistaken for a surviving civilian, winds up on the carrier after a rescue mission. There she forms a special bond with Myra, a nurse who sees her as a surrogate for her dead daughter whom she lost in a plane crash, going so far as to rename her Laura after her. Meanwhile, the Vajra senses Elaine is on the ship and rightly interprets her as a threat. Elaine, after seeking it out, uses her genocide perform to destroy the Vajra, but not before a piece of her arm gets hacked off. The head of the Vajra project, Dr. John Arbuckle here, is determined to recreate the Vajra unit using Genocyber's arm, but finds himself unable to control it. The Vajra then expands and absorbs the entire carrier and its crew, except for Myra, who Elaine is protecting. Myra wakes up to the horror surrounding her, and John Arbuckle gives her a big JRPG villain speech about how she must merge with the beast as well, so everyone can become the most powerful weapon ever. In a matter of just minutes, absolutely everything will be destroyed! <laughs> Now then, ladies, this is the new state of being. Myra responds appropriately. <laughs> Elaine turns into Genocyber, causing Myra to go insane after seeing visions that tell her that the plane crash her daughter died in was the same one caused by Genocyber in the last part, and Genocyber destroys the Vajra and the assimilated souls within while Myra is rescued by a helicopter. Part 2 ends with Genocyber destroying an entire country, and Myra now having gone completely off the deep end, believing that Genocyber is her daughter reborn, and yells for her to take her to heaven with her. Laura! She's come back for me. Look, she's an angel! End of part two. Part three. Oh boy. Entire centuries have passed and humanity has been waging a desperate and hopeless war against Genocyber with the Kuryu group at the forefront. One of the last remaining cities on Earth, Arc de Grand City, lives in relative stability, but most of the population is exploited labor, while the upper class lives in luxury and would like it very much to keep it that way. This is relayed to us by some of the most on-the-nose writing as possible. The more we let their dangerous ideas spread, the greater their numbers will become. That is the way it is with insects like these. I want them obliterated completely. That is your duty. The story focuses on a young man, Ryu, and his blind fiance, Mel, who work as street performers. After a performance for an upper-class audience goes awry, Ryu and Mel escape to the ruins beneath the city where they stumble across the fossilized remains of Genocyber. Apparently, Diana and Elaine, feeling that they are going to be pursued for the rest of their existence, decide to lie dormant for the past couple of centuries. Mel and Ryu are separated, with Ryu being taken in for questioning by the police, and Mel being taken in by a Christian Marxist cult who believed Genocyber was a gift from God to punish the sinners, and that Mel is God's messenger. On the surface, Ryu is subjected to an interrogation so intense he is rendered brain dead. Mel somehow senses this, and in her grief, drops this out of nowhere bombshell. Ryu, where are you? Why haven't you come back for me yet? <laughs> you don't know it, but I'm carrying your unborn child! Where the fuck? Shortly thereafter, police stormed the church and killed the entire congregation, including Mel. In an apparent death dream, Mel pleads to the souls of Diana and Elaine to awaken Genocyber and destroy the city. Genocyber then awakens with the merged souls of Diana, Elaine, and Mel, giving it a super-powered makeover. The city and its citizens are wiped out, Mel and Ryu are resurrected, Genocyber ascends into space where it commits suicide by cop by attacking and destroying a courier group space station, and the anime ends with Mel no longer blind, walking over to Genocyber's corpse, and hearing a baby crying. The end.
It should be said that I didn't go into Genocyber with the intention of fully eviscerating it. Even with its decades long reputation, I was ready and willing to give it a fair shake. And because of this, I was able to really see why some people say this anime deserves a second look. First, Tony Takazaki's design of the titular Genocyber is amazing. It really takes that biopunk horror design that one would see in Giver and amplifies it by making it more demonic, selling the fact that it is an otherworldly hell beast born from hatred and suffering, hell bent on vengeance. Also, huge props to the soundtrack, whose cold, unfeeling electronic music really meshes with the cyberpunk setting. Especially the main theme, which plays when Genocyber is about to start killing again, which sounds straight off a KMFDM album. But what really impressed me regarding Genocyber was its visual direction. A trashy 90s OVA is probably the last place I'd see animation mediums blend with one another, but this was an unexpected surprise to see. It's a creative choice that not only gives Genocyber a unique voice, but also gives it a trippy, unsettling tone throughout the story. Choices such as using photorealistic pencil drawings and flashbacks to make it feel like you're going over file photos in an archive, or using realistic images to make the psychic powers of the girls feel otherworldly. Worldly. It also helps deepen the impact of the splatter. In order to make some of the gore feel more properly icky, Genocyber will sometimes cut in shots of wet practical effects, and it works. <laughs> And even when it's not using different mediums for effect, there are still creative choices in how certain shots are framed. Sure, some of them look like the editors are having way too much fun goofing around with video toaster, but you can't discount the shots that obviously had a lot of planning and foresight that went into making them, like the camera going through the innards of a cyborg as she is ripped in half. Plus, this might be one of the few non-hentai titles I've seen so far where a scene is shot inside a vagina looking out. So really, Genocyber is a lot more inspired than one would expect from a schlocky gore-fest anime. Ohada and his staff really set out to give this anime a look of its own, and they succeeded. For the first episode. Tragically, the creative direction that gives Part 1 its own unique brand of cyberpunk horror is suspiciously absent for the rest of the series. The direction becomes completely standard afterwards, and only dares to get creative for the money shots. But unimaginative direction is the least of Part 2 and Part 3's problems. Because the main problem with Genocyber is that... <laughs> Let's ignore the problems that Part 1's story has for now because, believe me, they do exist. And focus on the problems that Parts 2 and 3 have. Namely the fact that they shouldn't exist. The stories that episodes 2 through 5 tell us are purely incidental. They don't add anything to the overall plot concerning the Kuryu group, the two sisters, their powers, or anything really concerning Genocyber at all. It also doesn't help that the story gradually loses some IQ points with each episode. For all its faults, Part 1 has an interestingly complex structure with multiple plot threads running concurrently with each other, all focusing on characters who have their own different agendas. Davey wants to find the secret behind the Kuryu group, Elaine wants to escape, Diana and Ree want to find Elaine, the cyborgs want to find Elaine before Reed does, etc. When part 2 rolls around, the story loses a lot of the complexity and mystery it has in favor of a stock horror narrative about a mad scientist goofing around with the unknowable, ending with him killing nearly every warm body in the vicinity. He tampered in God's domain. But part 2 gets off light considering that Elaine is still a principal character and they do at least try to connect it back to the events of part 1. It just comes off as extraneous fat at worst. Part 3 on the other hand? Oh brother. It's literally Cybernetics Guardian. Koichi Yohada did a remake of Cybernetics Guardian and hoped nobody would notice. It has the same themes of class struggle, a cult who worships a giant being of destruction, a protagonist who gets labeled as the chosen one, and said protagonist merging with the giant being of destruction to wreak havoc on the decadent ruling class. There are some changes, such as the cult being unambiguous good guys this time around, the class politics having more of a presence, and the protagonist's motivation being changed from a desire to do good to unbridled vengeance. But what exactly does this have to do with Genocyber? Genocyber and its overarching narrative only really has any presence at the beginning and end of the story. 
Genocyper only exists as a dormant plot device, with Diana's character being reduced to that of a disembodied point of conflict for Mel, and Elaine's character being reduced to that of reused cell overlays. The story feels so completely disconnected with Genocyber that episodes 4 and 5 really don't even need to be here. There's a reason why Manga Entertainment chose not to license these episodes back in 94. You could have replaced them with two episodes of Maple Town, and it wouldn't have made much of a difference. But even removing parts 2 and 3 from the equation would not fix the problems that Genocyber has. Parts 2 and 3's existence are merely just symptoms of a larger problem. <laughs> Due to the nature of the industry, language barriers, and lack of access to production documents, it's hard to find exact information on what production decisions were made in a specific anime, so a lot of what I said so far and am about to say is purely baseless speculation. But I feel like when they were doing the outline for the structure of Genocyber, they really couldn't decide between it being an episodic OVA or an OVA with an overarching story. So in order to fix this, they kind of meet in the middle. A similar structure was employed in Bubblegum Crisis where it had reoccurring villains and plot threads carrying over from other episodes, but ultimately chooses to focus on one story at a time. Genocyber attempts to do something similar with the first episode being devoted to building up the titular Genocyber and then continuing on to self-contained narratives that are connected by Genocyber and other plot threads like the Kuryu group. But the thing is, is that even though it was left unfinished, the parts of Bubblegum Crisis that do exist still feels like a unified whole. Genocyber, on the other hand, feels cluttered and disorganized. So part two establishes early in the story that Elaine has a cybernetic body from the neck down now that she has merged with Diana. However, this contradicts the final scene in the last episode where we see Elaine after her merging with Diana and her Genocyber rampage, and she still looks 100% human. There is very little consistency between Genocyber's storylines, whether it be character or plot-based. So if you end up watching the whole series in one go like I did, the narrative feels disjointed and sloppy. One might blame Koichi Ohada for this, as people have said before that he doesn't seem to really care about the story and mostly just uses it as a vehicle to make cool things happen. But if you've read or watched some of his interviews, you can kind of feel like he does want to make a good story. And if you squint hard enough watching this, you can tell he's trying to make it happen. But his perceived love for stupid awesome action sequences doesn't come from nowhere, and you get the feeling that he just comes up with these sick ass climaxes first, and then writes backwards from there. The thing is, though, is that he doesn't appear to know how to steer the direction of the plot to those scenes in a way that feels natural. So his plot structure always comes off as needlessly contrived at best, and haphazard and clumsy at worst. The clumsy structuring of his stories is what negatively affects Genocyber's overall structure the most. Genocyber is very unfocused because it appears that Ohada had so many ideas he wanted to use and decided to use all of them. What's worse is that he gives a disproportionate amount of focus to the ideas found in the pointless fluff episodes rather than the sturdier, more thought out ideas found in part one. Part 1 is where Genocyber's potential shines through the most because it establishes an interesting premise and sets up what should be a good cyberpunk bio-horror techno-thriller with plenty of intrigue and action. Instead, Ohada just treats Part 1 as nothing more than a prologue to what he sees as the real meat of the story, an excuse to show off more gory scenes and a cover version of a song he wrote years ago. Part 1 is the best part of Genocyber because it has creative direction, more focus, and a plot that develops into something more than just Genocyber fall, everyone dies. But as good, or at least compelling as it is, it's still adversely affected by Ohada treating it as a setup. One of my biggest grievances I have with Plot 1 is that... <laughs> Show Don't Tell is a reoccurring problem we have on the show, but this is very egregious. Any scenes where there are no fights are just conversations between one character to another, or themselves, to just say something along the lines of, okay, so here's what we know so far, or okay, so here's what we're gonna do next. Sub or dub, all the dialogue feels so artificial that I'm half expecting the characters to just periodically say, you keeping up, in between sentence breaks. Nothing about the way the characters speak feels organic. Hey, why don't you go get some pussy, huh? <laughs> <laughs> That's what I'm about to do. With a few exceptions. Episode 1 is so front-loaded with backstory, and yet the structure of it suggests that it had enough material to stagger out for at least three episodes, but since it's all crammed in in under 45 minutes, it feels rushed. And when a writer appears to be more focused on telling us a character's backstory than allowing that backstory to unfold and give us a better understanding to what that character actually is, it creates an interesting ripple effect. Oh. 
Can't talk about the poor writing of Jenna Cyber without mentioning the other guy behind this disaster piece. A criticism I've run into regarding Aikawa's body of work is that his writing tends to be a little overdramatic, sometimes appearing to add pathos just for the sake of pathos. Your mileage may vary on this of course, but his reliance on tragedy and attempting to weave somber narratives into stories can get grating for some. There are still people out there who really did not like him shifting the focus of Full Metal Alchemist away from shonen action to bittersweet drama. But in his early career, there were far worse problems. His writing was just a bunch of edgy nonsense full of unlikable characters and themes that were cynical, nihilistic, and above all else, juvenile. Jenna Cyber, being two years removed from when Aikawa would go work on the Desco, kinda sorta represents a transition period between his immature pessimism and his adoration for the bittersweet, meaning you kinda get the worst of both worlds. A reoccurring theme in Aikawa's work, especially his early work, is that human beings are the real monsters because they are just that shitty. While he would develop some nuance to this theme in later works, here it all reads like the writings of a 10th grader who just discovered that injustice in the world exists. Aikawa really spends a lot of time laying it on thick about the infinite cruelty others are willing to inflict on their fellow man and how we should all feel sad about it. It's not enough that the faceless bullies beat up a little kid, no, it's important that the kid also gets his pants pulled down and molested during it. How about reducing a group of children to pace with a machine gun? That do anything for ya? Or maybe having government soldiers massacre an entire population of poor people, including children, and have the camera pan over their bodies while the mayor who ordered said massacre gives a speech about everlasting peace. But their wishes have borne fruit, and their seed has grown into a magnificent blossom. Thank you. Thank you all. But if these are supposed to be powerful examples of humanity's boundless brutality towards one another, why do I feel nothing? Aside from the holy shit they actually went there shock one might get when watching these moments for the first time, you don't really feel anything once that initial shock wears off. There are certainly scenes where, judging by the way they are shot and animated, it does feel like they want to incite an emotional response from the audience, and yet it doesn't seem to work. This is because there's no real emotional core to Genocyber. Yeah, an anime called Genocyber lacks heart. Shocking, I know. Despite its best efforts, none of the events that happen in Genocyber carry any emotional weight to them. This is because every character in Genocyber is flat and uninteresting. All the antagonists are either dispatched quickly, complete non-entities within the story, or just so completely absurdly evil that they feel less like characters and more like forces of nature. Hey, when eliminating all potential witnesses at a hospital, maybe not spread their blood and organs everywhere after killing them. Cleaners are people too, you know. Thank you. Mel and Ryu are completely blank characters who spend most of their screen time jerked around by other characters just so they can be railroaded to the plot. Mel deciding to merge with Genocyber at the end is the only decision she makes on her own. Myra does not get enough screen time to justify the tragedy of her descent into insanity, but even when the camera's focused on her, it can't decide whether to frame her as a tragic figure or just some lady who's cuckoo for Cocoa Puffs. Laura! Laura! You have to kill all the other monsters on the ship for mommy! You have to save us! Laura! Huh? Davey has zero motivation for why he's even pursuing the Kuryu group in the first place, and he's only there to provide info dumps and be set dressing for a gory money shot once he stops being useful. But the characters who get it the worst in Genocyber are the two sisters. The whole story is centered around Diana and Elaine and how the suffering inflicted upon them since birth was the reason they fused into a monstrous hell beast and how tragic it is they were robbed of a normal happy life. But thanks to the writing and structure of Genocyber, none of that plaintiveness ever comes to the surface. The writers don't seem to have a full grasp of Diana's character, often having her personality change on a whim simply because the plot demands so. One minute she's a cold, uncaring cutthroat. The next she's a stern but caring big sister. Hold back, Elaine. Hold back your Vajra. Let me protect you. Come home, please. Elaine! The next she's a resentful psychopath. How does that feel, Elaine? I'm gonna tear you in two. <laughs> and don't give me that whole, well, we're just seeing her true character unfold. No, this is just another example of Ohada's poor pacing at work. He wanted to cram in a whole OVA series story in under 45 minutes, which leads to Diana's drastic shifts in personality between scenes. And then there's Elaine. Poor Elaine. 
Out of all the characters in Genocyber, Elaine not only gets the most characterization, but also the most consistent characterization. Which is interesting because A, she's mute, and B, is only in the anime for three episodes. This scene alone is probably the most effective character moment we see in Genocyber, and it has zero spoken dialogue. <laughs> the problem is that there are not enough scenes like that. Once again, we have the problem of part one having too much story crammed into less than an hour of runtime, so we don't get enough personal time with Elaine to have the emotional beats involving her fully hit. Like, imagine if part one was just a whole series. When Elaine and the street urchin escape from Diana on the subway, they could have had another emotional character moment like that other one to better establish why Elaine wants to be free, rather than having that motivation established to us via another character through exposition. That would make the scene where Diana kills Elaine feel way more impactful and might even be a good final shot of an episode, rather than just immediately going into the next scene and not allowing us to fully take in the tragedy of Elaine's death. Because of splotchy characterization, poor pacing, and an unfocused story, Genocyber has no emotional centerpiece. That's why the violence in Genocyber feels so cheap. Once you get over the initial surprise, there's really nothing else there. To underline my point, let's take a look at another anime that has a similar level of violence to Genocyber, but tells a much more meaningful story because of it. Berserk is one of those titles that, when you first come across it, your eye might just be drawn to the level of violence found within that story. But Berserk isn't known for that. When people talk about Berserk, they talk about how it's a dark tragedy about a cast of characters trying to overcome misfortune after misfortune, whether it be by fate or by their own decisions. Either that or the ungodly wait between chapters. In Berserk, there's an event known simply as the Eclipse. Not to go too much into spoiler territory, but it's a scene filled with intense bloodshed, the deaths of many established characters, and probably one of the most horrific depictions of rape ever seen in an anime. While the scene does carry a level of notoriety amongst fans, it's mostly remembered because of how it was all a culmination of different characters' motivations and events that led up to that point. Moreover, when the nightmarish and heart-rending events that occur during the Eclipse happen, we are hit all the harder because of the time we spent with these characters, got to know them, realize who they are. Think how an event like an Eclipse would play out if, leading up to it, we didn't have scenes like this. I don't want to die. For me, that is the only reason I keep fighting. There is nothing to save myself for or give myself to. I fight because I know nothing else because we have these little character moments, it makes those moments where bad things happen to these characters resonate. Without scenes like that, an event like the Eclipse just becomes cheap and exploitative. Like Genocyber. <laughs> it didn't have to be this way for Genocyber. If the story had been put in the hands of creators who were willing to write a complete story without getting sidetracked by ancillary fluff, who were willing to pace it out evenly through multiple episodes and allow for a more fixed vision to come into play, and who were willing to give characters the emotional depth needed to make the objectionable content not come off as tasteless as it did, it could have been a good anime. Genocyber instead was given to a writer-director team who exasperated each other's flaws, and the end result was a vulgar, confusing B-grade OVA that's only remembered for how shocking the amount of gore was in it. Look into your heart and ask yourself this question. Would you still watch this anime if there was no gore? Would you even watch this anime if the gore was toned down even significantly? Yeah, I didn't think so. However, Genocyber can also be seen as a lesson. An example of why you should not use hardcore violence and gore in your anime so lightly. There's a mature way to do it, but Genocyber chose not to walk that path. And I feel like maybe the creators took that lesson to heart. Joe Aikawa would go on to make some critically acclaimed works after this, and Ohana, well, hmm. Genocyber is not a bad anime because it has excessive amounts of gore spewing from every orifice. It's a bad anime because it's a bad anime. When you try to throw a mature story, some cynical themes, an angry tone, and a king's ransom of animated intestines all together in a blender without any thought or care, 
You're not going to get a thought-provoking tragic horror story out of it. You're just going to wind up with a sticky red mess. 